Over now to our resident film buff, Richard Jobson, for another packed edition of The Movie Show. Tonight on The Movie Show, a childhood classic revisited how little women made it from the 19th century to the 1990s. The girls in the gang, Alec and Anders hangs tough with My Crazy Life. And the powerful, provocative priest, British director Antonia Bird, on her brave new drama. Hello and welcome to The Movie Show. First published in 1868, Louisa May Alcott's novel, Little Women, has been delighting readers, both old and young, for over 125 years. Set against a backdrop of civil war on New England, Alcott's tender epic focuses on four sisters as they move from girlhood to womanhood. While very much a product of its era, Little Women has proved timeless in its appeal, with the story's themes of family, femininity, and friendship gaining in resonance as it passes from one generation to the next. Now, Alcott's book has been lovingly translated to the screen by Australian director Gillian Armstrong, introducing a contemporary cinematic audience to the story of Joel, Meg, Beth, and Amy March. Beginning in front of the warm heart of the March family home, the film charts the young lives of each of the four sisters, lives which embrace a full range of literary incidents and emotions as they grow up and learn what it means to become independent women. Enhancing the story are some fine performances, most notably from an Oscar-nominated Winona Ryder as a spirited, free-thinking Joe, interview with the vampires Kirsten Dunst as a 12-year-old romantic Amy, and Susan Sarandon, her experience and dignity making her perfect for the girl's warm and wise mommy. Far from being an anachronism in the 1990s, Alcott's 19th century story remains moving and enjoyably melodramatic, its scope and sweep undiminished by the years. It's a breath of fresh air amidst today's male-dominated movies, its story of female spirit and independence inspiring for the young and still uplifting for those who, like me, may find it a little tougher identifying with its abundance of youthful idealism. It's a film which might not have existed at all if it weren't for director Gillian Armstrong, producer Denise Denovi, and writer Robin Swicord. Three women whose strength, tenacity, and devotion to the project helped bring these little women to the big screen. We thought that um, a real adaptation of the, of the book had never been made, that although films had been made that were called Little Women, the real story of Jo becoming an artist and facing her talent and the family facing her hardship and so forth, I never felt had really been conveyed and that those other films had kind of met a temporal cultural need about how can we get these girls married and how can we get these girls to you know, lock themselves up in a kind of domestic situation and it was the antithesis of what was intended by the novel. Every time I read it, it's very moving to me and inspiring and you know, there's a cult of women, and it's a very large one, that uh, really say that the book and the character of Joe formed many of their dreams and aspirations. For me, it was the first example in my life of a female writer that Louisa May Alcott was an example of a woman who had grown up wanting to be a writer and had become one. And then Joe herself was a girl different from the girls around her, who was quite ambitious and wanted to take her family out of debt and wanted to make her mark in the world. And I was so relieved to have that example of a girl in, in fiction that I can relate to. I, I felt that I recognized myself over time. Joe, tell me what happens next after the Duke turns his back on his family fortune and saves <laughs> Lady Zara. Don't know. It's all murder and gore. The damsel's in distress. Oh, I love the damsel's in distress. Oh, Beth, truly, I don't know if I could ever be good like Marmy. I rather crave violence. If only I could be like father and go to war and stand up to the lions of injustice. And so Marmy does in her own way. Yes. But I want to do something different. I don't know what it is yet, but I want to watch for it. You will find it, Joe. We met with a lot of male directors, and many of them would have been a good idea for the film and done a great job. But in our hearts, we had an instinct 
that a woman director would bring something special to the film, and Gillian Armstrong definitely did. There's a certain sensitivity to the relationships of sisters and mothers and daughters, and also that sort of dom domesticity that I think comes through so beautifully in the film, that sort of warm, nurturing environment which, where, you know, Gillian is a, is a wife and mother and has experienced that. And um, also, I mean, technically, she's a brilliant director and a great artist. Her films are very deeply felt and well thought out and technically really, really excellent. The exciting thing about bringing Little Women um, into the cinema once again was that it's a book that was so important for women and had never really ever been realized by a woman, never been directed by a woman. And I felt no matter what, because I actually didn't go back and see the other versions, but I felt no matter what, I, I have to be bringing something new and fresh to it by the very fact that I was a little girl, I was like Jo, and I, and I have a sister. So you know, I, because it's such an intimate coming of age story, I felt that um, it was one of those rare ones where the sex of the director really did matter. Well, certainly at the very beginning, when we were assembling the crew, we were not initially thinking, this has got to be an all-girls show. In fact, I brought in um, several male directors that I had wanted to work with. It turned out that Jill was the best director for the job. And, it, and, and likewise with producers, we looked at a lot of different producers, and it turned out that Denise saw the film most closely to what I had intended. I want to change, but I, I can't, and I, I just know I'll never fit in anywhere. Oh, Joe. Joe, you have so many extraordinary gifts. How can you expect to leave an ordinary life? You're ready to go out and, and find a good use for your talents. I don't know what I shall do without my job. Go. Embrace your liberty and see what wonderful things come with. I don't think it was more difficult than the average film to get made. They're all difficult to get made. But uh, we probably were under a bit more of a crunch in terms of the budget because it wasn't a big action genre film where you have a certain degree of security that this film is going to be a hundred million dollar mega hit. So we did have to make the film for uh, a judicious budget. They thought it was something that wasn't important. Um, you know, it's a girls' film. Girls, they, that was in their mind, that girls' films aren't important. So we were left alone, but we weren't um, privileged to have a lot of money to make the film with because girls' films aren't important. So that was our main battle. It was, a sort of a, it was an economic one to actually get a proper budget to make the film properly. Oh, Josh, no, I'm sorry. No, no, stay. It's not a bad hiding place. You see, I don't uh, know anyone, so I feel awkward just standing and staring at people. Oh, should I put on my jacket? Oh, I never know the rules. Here, uh, um, I'm Laurie. Theodore Lawrence, but I'm uh, called Laurie. Too much. Um, so, who are you staring at? Uh, you, actually. What, uh, what game were you playing? <laughs> I don't know, but I think I won. <laughs> who else? Well, I was, I was quite taken with that one. That's Meg. That's my sister. I do think that we, that's the producer, the writer, and myself, always felt that, it, that this is a great story and that it's accessible to, to, to men and women, really, from 10 to 70. Um, and I, I do believe the studio didn't really understand that themselves until they saw it. I think they too thought they were making a film for little girls until I screened it for all those men in suits and they all cried. It is always hard to convince people that a film with mostly female protagonists is going to be a mainstream success because they always court the international audience and they think of that audience as liking action pictures and liking movies with male protagonists. So we, that was the uphill climb. I think Hollywood is taking a look at our film and realizing that people want something that is very heartfelt and has meaning to it as well as being entertaining and fun. That they're not, we shouldn't be afraid of dealing with those kind of themes and those kind of feelings. People want to have an intense emotional experience when they see a movie. Um, and also that a film that is basically 
you know, all women, that the, where the cast is all women, is of interest to everybody, to men as well as, as women. Gentlemen, <clears throat> I propose the admission of a new member to our theatrical society. Theodore Lawrence will put it to a vote. No. He'll laugh at our acting and poke fun at us later. He'll think it's only a game. He won't, upon my word, as a gentleman. Joe, it's only ladies. We don't guard our conduct in the same way. We bare our souls and tell the most appalling secrets. He would find us improper. Oh, Teddy would do nothing of the sort. Oh, please. Let's try him, shall we? Hello, <laughs> artists. May I present myself? As an actor, a musician, and a loyal and very humble servant. A lot has been written about, especially in Britain, about, you know, it's a feminist piece and these hard-nosed feminists have brought it alive. And that's not why I, I did the film. There is certainly, obviously, a feminist subtext to the story, but essentially it's a story about people. It's a human drama. And I actually feel that it was Louise's love poem to her sisters. I really feel like this is the first true adaptation of the book. The other films were geared simply to sort of, you know, showing the relationships of the sisters and they were heavily edited. A lot of the themes of the books were ignored. Um, so, you know, I think that uh, uh, immodestly I should say that we're the most successful adaptation. I hope that other films like the one we made, I hope so. I think that Little Women is unusual in that it has a lot of female protagonists, that it addresses women's real inner lives, that women are subjects, not objects, and there is not nearly enough of that. Already a hit in the U.S., and perhaps even with a chance of winning an Oscar or two next week, Little Women opens in the U.K. next weekend. We're going to take a short break now, but be sure to join us again straight after, when we'll be taking a look at two of the month's freshest new releases. Alice and Anders' unique look at life in an old girl gang, Mi Vida Loca, and British director Antonio Bird's Priest. Welcome back. Although initially made for the small screen, Antonio Bird's Priest is getting a cinematic release from this weekend, which is just as well. For this British drama tackles such strong subject matter and exerts such powerful emotive force that it's hard to imagine how it could be contained by anything less than the big screen. Scripted by Jimmy McGovern, the TV writer best known for Brookside and Cracker, this exploration of intolerance, incest and homosexuality within the Catholic Church should provoke passionate responses from the most apathetic of audiences. Linus Roach plays Father Greg, an idealistic young priest who comes to a left-wing Liverpool parish determined to do good, only to find himself tested beyond the limits of his experience by some faith-shaking ethical dilemmas. Reflecting Father Greg's own state of mind, the film's real strength lies in its shifting spiritual standpoint, recognizing religious hypocrisy and questioning Catholic doctrines without ever losing sight of the importance of the church in people's lives. Balancing the serious nature of the material with some nicely judged comic moments, Priest is a perfectly pitched film which forces you to think and feel in equal measure. Indeed, so supremely moving is the film that from time to time, one feels right on the governor and director Bird may be guilty of over-manipulating their audience, although the emotional force accumulated over the course of the film is ultimately undeniably well-earned. Having already received standing ovations at the Edinburgh, Toronto and Sundance Film Festivals, there's no doubt that general audiences will be similarly affected by what must be the most stirring British film in years. Director Bird is currently putting the finishing touches to her first Hollywood feature, but she found time to talk to us about her powerful and provocative film. The main thing that attracted me to it was its humanity, the fact that it was a very human film. It had a very strong central story. It was a man going through many moral dilemmas, which I think are dilemmas that we all probably go through during our life at some time or other, or at least very similar. Um, I wanted to make a film about intolerance. I mean, running through all my work is a serious look at injustice and the fact that we're living in a very unjust, very intolerant society. And this, for me, is the ultimate film about intolerance. And I think it's, I think it's working as well. It seems to be affecting people and making people seriously examine 
their own bigoted attitudes. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. May the Lord be in your heart and help you to confess your sins with true sorrow. What did she say? I can't tell you that. She's my daughter. I can't break the seal of the confession. You know that. A man once paid 24,000 pieces of silver for the right to commit incest. You know, I'm sold in that mind. Pope Alexander the Sixth. Incest is evil. Incest is human. It's the most natural thing in the world. The most unnatural. <laughs> because you're the expert, aren't you, Father? You've never been with a woman. Let alone Father to child, but you're the bloody expert. The character of the father who is sexually abusing his daughter in the film is there for a very important reason. He's there, he's, he's true evil. He's a man who's raping his 14-year-old daughter. It's a heterosexual, sexual situation. And it's there, I think, to contrast with the gay relationship between two consenting adults and the privacy of their own home, warm, loving, beautiful friendship and love affair. How can that be wrong? What is wrong with that? And that's why we have this horror balanced against this thing that many people still think is horrible. Many people still think homosexuals are doing something obscene and disgusting. Why? It's their choice. And why can't they have that choice? What kind of society are we living in that judges people in that way? I think I love him. Yes. Do you want him? Yes. All the time? A lot of the time. And is that sinful? Sick. So, to itch for a man is sick. To want to scratch that itch, to want to make love to another man, that's sinful. Yes. And to want to go on scratching, to live with another man, well, that's permanent sin. That's evil. That's depart from me, ye cursed stuff, right? <laughs> yes. I was very shocked while we were making this film and now in the aftermath publicising the film at the bigotry that I've been coming across and I was even more shocked. I didn't know this, I should have known this, but I didn't know this, that the Catholic Church still considers it to be an abomination, quote the Bible, to be gay. I find that incredible in 1995 and I find it incredible that we can't interpret the Bible in a modern way. Christ gave his life! What well, we're asked for is celibacy, and we can't even manage that. Christ didn't ask us to be celibate. It's man-made. It's a man-made thing. solemnly swear? That's our currency, Matthew, solemn vows. And we debase them because we can't even stick to them ourselves. Do you think some people will look uh, on your film as an attack on, on the trust establishment? I think if they do, they'll be wrong. I think it's an attack on religious hypocrisy. I don't think it's an at attack on the Catholic Church as a whole. It is definitely throwing very strong questions at the hierarchy of the Catholic Church, and it's definitely demanding debate and discussion. But it's not coming down on any one side. It's actually saying, this is what's going on, this is what it's like, this is, these are the problems, what are we going to do about it? And one thing I really wanted people to see was the actually incredibly difficult job that a priest has, um, and the huge dilemmas and moral dilemmas that they have to go through in their work. Um, but more than that, I just wanted people to leave the cinema questioning their own intolerance, maybe with a new attitude about other people, about not judging people without really understanding why people do the things they do. Priest opens in the UK this weekend. Following it into cinemas next week is American director Alison Anders' new film, Mi Vida Loca or to give it its English title, My Crazy Life. Like Gas Food Lodging, the 1992 film which first brought Anders to the attention of moviegoers, My Crazy Life focuses predominantly on female protagonists 
giving us a unique view of a gangland subculture that's usually presented from a male perspective. Set in the Echo Park neighborhood of Los Angeles, Anders' film introduces us to the young Latina homegirls who form the female front of the city's Mexican-American gangs. Rather than telling a straight story, Anders studies this close-knit community from numerous points of view, creating a tapestry of experience which helps us see beyond the girls' intimidating attitude and into the reality of their outlaw lives and complex camaraderies. The different narratives that compromise the film work both as separate stories and, ultimately, as a single piece. The quiet drama of the individual tales sneaking up on you as they take their indirect routes towards resolution. A more than worthy follow-up to Gas Food Lodging, My Crazy Life is a vibrant, heartbreaking drama, standing boldly apart from the mainstream and filled with beautiful directorial touches. As in a previous film, Anders is exploring the lives, desires and conflicts of women who live in the margins of everyday society. And it's her obvious empathy for these characters that gives My Crazy Life its tender power. We talked to the director about hanging with the homegirls. I'm always very interested in putting people on the screen that you don't get to see on the screen very often. And certainly with Latinos, you don't see them on the screen often at all um, in the United States. I mean, this was one of the first films with, you know, that was really from a Latino perspective. Um, even though it was from a white chick perspective, it was...